The Israeli-Palestinian conflict dominates American news coverage of international issues. Given that news coverage is Americans' main source of information on the conflict, it becomes important to examine the stories the news media are telling us and to ask the question, does the news coverage reflect the reality on the ground? Gun battles rage tonight in some of the heaviest fighting. A battle for survival for of the Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. One of the things you have to keep in mind when you're looking at how media report on something like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not only understanding what's there in the story, but more importantly, what's not there, what's being left out. In that sense, absence is as vital as presence in terms of how people make sense of the story. Context is everything. The context that's often missing from the current reporting is that the Palestinian uprising is a revolt against the 34-year-long occupation. And if there's no occupation in the story, then the story doesn't really make sense, and the occupation is frequently missing. A typical TV news report, for example, um, on you know ABC News will show dramatic pictures of, of these confrontations where Palestinians are, are confronting Israeli troops and the Israeli troops are responding. But Friday saw more clashes in Hebron between stone-throwing Palestinian youths and Israeli soldiers armed with For most guns. Americans who don't understand the history of the conflict, uh, this is an example of you know, riots that are going on where uh, the, the authorities are taking measures to crack down. What's not mentioned is the fact that these confrontations are taking place on occupied territory, uh, that the, the Israeli troops who are there are defending um, an occupation that's, uh, that doesn't have any international legitimacy, that's illegal. The American media, they are concentrating only on the deeds, on the violence, and not on the reasons, and not on the basic facts of occupation. Israeli troops were pelted with stones and they responded with tear gas and rubber bullets. This is not presented as an army using its arsenal against uh, young people who are uh, largely unarmed and uh, who are protesting because of the occupation, the siege, the, the total oppression of a whole nation. The lack of context is so dramatic that only 4% of the network news reports on the occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip mention that the West Bank and Gaza Strip are occupied. The Israeli military sends its troops into the occupied territories to defend what is considered an illegal occupation. And when the population there resists, uh, Israel is, is presented as being under attack. Israel was responding to an attack today. Israel has beefed up forces following a Palestinian mortar attack. They don't present it as saying Israel is the aggressor, Israel is killing people on their own land, in their own homes as an occupier. But no, Israel is defending itself. To Sharon, the West Bank invasion is simple self-defense. The Israeli Prime Minister reiterated Israel's right to self-defense. Israel's basic posture is anything but defensive. Israel is the only country in the world right now which, in contravention to UN Security Council resolutions, maintains tens of thousands of heavily armed troops outside its borders in somebody else's country for the sole purpose of taking their land away from them and in the process forcing them to live under the worst form of tyranny imaginable, which is a foreign military dictatorship. The tanks, the gunships, the snipers, they are all on Palestinian land. And I don't see why they have to protect themselves on our land if they're occupying our land. That, that context is always missing. A crowd throwing stones and homemade stun grenades at the soldiers, the troops opening fire, killing two Palestinians and injuring... So even when Israel is busy murdering people in cold blood, it is always presented as part of the self-defense mechanism of Israel. When Israel in the occupied territories now claim that they have to defend themselves, they are defending themselves in the sense that any military occupier has to defend itself against the population they're crushing. Prime Minister Ariel Sharon justified the siege as self-defense. You can't defend yourself when you're militarily occupying somebody else's land. That's not defense. Call it what you like, it's not defense. Public relations works not only by controlling the content of media reports, but also by making sure that some voices are never heard. The marginalization of the Israeli peace movement in the American media is an example of how this works. 
it's been the point of view of the Israeli peace movement for years that the fundamental cause of the conflict uh, is the Israeli occupation of Palestinian land and, and the settlement policies. Um, but that view is considered in the United States something that's extremely marginal and that you, you rarely see that, uh, that view put forward in the American media. We, in the women's peace camp in Israel, organized a mass vigil of women in black and a mass march through the streets of Jerusalem. 2,000 women strong, both Israelis and Palestinians. Can you picture that dramatic moment? 2,000 women dressed in black marching down the streets of Jerusalem to the walls of the old city where we hung banners from the walls of the old city saying peace in three languages, Hebrew, Arabic, and English. And guess what? It didn't get into the media. That's not the kind of image that the media wants to create because then it, all these images of Jews and Arabs working together, of Palestinians wanting peace, would create a kind of dissonance. It would contradict the message that the media has been giving us for years and years. Then how do you explain it? You can't explain it. The Israeli public relations machine knows that if the views and voices of Jews who disagree with its policies were to become public, it would be impossible to maintain the lie that any criticism of Israel is by definition anti-Semitic. In fact, the accusation of anti-Semitism has been Israel's most effective strategy in silencing dissent. And American journalists in particular have been targets of this tactic. Any environment in which a journalist or any person steps forward and starts making serious criticism of Israel, of America's relationship with Israel, the unconditional support for Israel, the failure of any serious pressure to be put upon Israel by the United States to prevent the building of further settlements for Jews and Jews only on Arab land. Any suggestion that the war between the Israelis and the Palestinians is a colonial war will be met by a deafening chorus of accusations, slanderous and lying though they are, that the person who brings up that subject is in some form an anti-Semite or a racist. And this remains the constant weapon that is used. The fact that anti-Semitism is alive and well in the world today makes it all the more important to differentiate between real anti-Semitism that needs to be condemned and opposed in its own right and its misuse as a PR strategy. Trying to scare people into silence by conflating any criticism of Israeli policies with anti-Semitism in fact detracts from the very real threat that anti-Semitism does pose. Because there are anti-Semites in the world, there are racists, and if this continued campaign of abuse against decent people, trying to shut them up by falsely accusing them of anti-Semitism continues, the word anti-Semitism will begin to become respectable. And that is a great danger. And then the really bad guys, and they're around, they do, there are people who want to burn synagogues, just like there are people who want to burn mosques, they'll start coming into their own. <laughs>